This week on the other side, politicians keep telling the lie that they're giving us free stuff. Don't be fooled. Government doesn't have anything to give other than what they've already taken from us in taxes. And we always end up paying sooner or later. We'll explain it all because if the upcoming Queensland election's any indicator, the lies about free stuff will be coming thick and fast at the federal election early next year. And it's the young who always get fooled and fall for it every time. Also this week, Mr Popular becomes very unpopular. Barack Obama's magic touch disappears and he's angry about his newfound irrelevance. You're the voice. Well, not really. Politicians refuse to listen and continue to show astounding arrogance. We'll explore the Premier's appalling response to the voice no vote and anniversary and to the King's visit. And war preparations in the Northern Territory. A new American report reveals what's being built up there to get ready for a possible US war with China. This is The Other Side. G'day Perth, g'day Hobart, g'day Australia. This is episode 332 of The Other Side for the weekend commencing Friday the 18th of October 2024. I'm Damien Curry, and The Other Side is of course your weekly analysis of the best news and commentary to get you smart for the weekend and the week ahead without the woke. With a new show dropping on YouTube every Friday night at 7pm Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Our bias, we always declare it right up front. Our perspective on the news is centre right. What we would call good old fashioned everyday common sense Aussie values. And most importantly, we pay our own way with your voluntary support. And speaking of voluntary support, we have a big announcement to make. The launch of our new website and our new members club, the exclusive side. If you'd like to support the show on a regular basis and do it directly so that we get all the contributions and can put every single cent towards the show with no one taking a cut, then head over to othersidetv.com.au and sign up. We'll send you a link to the show every week via email or SMS, if you prefer, uh, and we can then never lose contact, no matter what the government or big tech might do to try to censor us. That's Side tv.com.au. Check it out. All the political insiders are saying that the mood on Anthony Albanese after his tone-deaf purchase of a $4.5 million beachside home on the New South Wales North Coast this week has really shifted inside the Labor Party ranks and among the party's federal MPs. People are not happy and they're letting it be known. Albo was warned, apparently, not to make the purchase so close to an election and amid a national housing crisis. He didn't listen. Some commentators are suggesting that changes are afoot to tax rules around capital gains exemptions, discounts and negative gearing. Peter Credlin says if that's the case and Albo acted because he knew those changes were coming, then that's not just political stupidity, it's actually very dodgy. Personally, I don't reckon we're going to be going to the next election early next year with Albo as the Labor leader anymore if he doesn't start to really turn things around and fast. And, you know, that'd be bad news for our country, back to the old revolving door of prime ministers. But the biggest issue facing our nation is housing. Robert Gottliebson wrote in The Australian this week that he's never seen the Australian dwelling construction industry in such a mess in the more than half a century that he's been watching it. He says short-term remedies like skills training and importing more skilled workers while cutting other immigration will help, as will sorting out the CFMEU and union rackets that cause apartment costs to be much higher than necessary. But he says that isn't gonna solve the more complex underlying problems that we face. One such problem, according to Gottliebson, is red tape and a rise in bureaucrats charged with planning restrictions and blocking development. He's absolutely right. The ever increasing size of government in our country and the increasing intrusiveness of it into business and even into our private lives is really killing our nation's prosperity as well as people's liberty and most importantly, their quality of life and general happiness. And people are starting to wake up. They're starting to put two and two together these days and seeing that 
you know, there is a serious problem in this ever-increasing government, ever-increasing bureaucracy. And that's more or less the theme of this week's episode of The Other Side. The left are having a lot of trouble coping with this new world order in which people are waking up to their games and are standing up to their bullying tactics, pointing them out and saying, no, nah, no, you're not getting away with that anymore. And they hate it and they're getting angry. So they're going to get nastier. Their old tricks of just playing the emotional card aren't working. Kamala Harris in America, despite being in power for almost four years, and despite the Democrats having a majority in both the houses of Congress for the first two years of her time in office, in other words, having all the power that you could possibly need to bring in any law you li you'd like to, she still blames Donald Trump for there not being tough laws on immigration and border control. It's truly bizarre. And it all came to the fore in her first non-softball adversarial interview of this campaign on the conservative American network, Fox News. Journalist Brett Beyer played the vice president a soundbite of a woman whose daughter was murdered by a criminal who'd entered the US illegally and was released into the community under the Biden-Harris catch and release policy. I believe the Biden-Harris administration open border policies are responsible for the death of my daughter. That's the early days. So do you owe them an apology is what I I'm saying. I will tell you that I am so sorry for her loss. I am so sorry for her loss, sincerely. But let's talk about what is happening right now with an individual who does not want to participate in solutions. Let's talk about that as well. But do you Brett, want to in, answer in all that? fairness, I told you, I feel awful for what she and her family have experienced. During that time, you said repeatedly that the border was secure. When in your mind did it start becoming a crisis? I think it, we've had a broken immigration system transcending, by the way, Donald Trump's administration even before. Let's, let's all be honest about that. I have no pride in saying that this is a perfect immigration system. I've been clear. I think we all are. Yes, but we're not all the vice president of the United States with the power to actually do something about it. This interview was so weird. It's like she was unaware that she actually is in power. Let me repeat, she had total control for the first two years of both houses of Congress and the executive. And even now, without a majority in the House, the Biden-Harris administration can still do presidential executive orders to get things done, like Trump did before 2020. So blaming Donald Trump for your failures after almost four years in office is simply absurd or a lie. And Congress ultimately is the only place that that's going to get fixed, Brett. Well, that's how this system that's, works. That's the premise that's, of this question. But there were 90 the plus works. executive orders that were rescinded in the first days. Many of those were Trump border policies. I'm not going to stay here because there's other things to talk about. But you frequently talk to the Border Patrol Union for support of that bipartisan bill, and they did. They supported it. But they also just endorsed Donald Trump and said, you've been, quote, a failure with border security. Why do you think they said that? I think they're frustrated, and I get it. They want support. They want support, and that's what that border security bill would have done. These guys down at the border, these men and women, they're working hard. They're working around the clock. I get it. She gets it. Listen, when the left start to do that, when the left start to go emotional, uh, that you know that they don't have a rational argument anymore. Uh, and that's exactly what she's doing there. And it used to work for them, right? People go, oh, she's so sensitive. She gets it. People are waking up to it now. And it's a pity. It's a pity she didn't get it in 2021 before they rescinded all those Trump executive orders, then proceeded to do nothing for two years when she had complete power to do something. But hey, I'm so relatable. I get it. Trump's interview answers are not well structured grammatically, but at least he gets the point across and says actual things about policy and approach so that people do get a feeling that they at least know what they're buying. They know where he stands on things. Kamala Harris gives grammatically nice sounding answers and shows all the feels, but getting a straight, clear answer out of her to anything is impossible. And that is a deliberate strategy. It's not accidental, it's not a problem. They're doing it deliberately. It's called being artfully vague to allow people to put their own ideas of what they thought you said over what you said. 
right? We'll do more analysis of all that in the show next week. But that kind of lying is really deceptive and sneaky PR, black PR stuff. Uh, and it's really, really dangerous. I'll take Donald Trump's boorishness and obvious hype and exaggeration over sneakiness and deliberate deception any day. This week, we were treated to this wonderful picture in our media. It's our esteemed Prime Minister riding on the Gold Coast light rail with the Premier of Queensland, Stephen Smiles Miles. The picture was in a tweet from the Labor Party on the campaign trail for the October 26 Queensland election with the caption, just two blokes catching the Gold Coast light rail for 50 cents. How good. Yes, how good. This photo for me really sums up the whole problem with Australian politics right now. We've got too many voters, particularly young ones, who don't really understand how government works, how our economy works, where money comes from, and how government is paid for. You know, economics is like gravity. It's a law that can't be defied, despite what they sing in Wicked the Musical, defying gravity as a supernatural fantasy best left to the Wicked Witch of the West. You can't defy science and reality, and the economic reality is that it costs a lot more than 50 cents per passenger to run trains and buses. So when governments surprisingly tell us right before elections that they're suddenly reducing the price of government services, you should take it with a massive pinch of salt. Actually, we should be highly offended because they're taking us for fools, or at least they think they're taking us for fools because we're not as dumb as they like to think anymore these out-of-touch uh, elites in the Labor Party. By midday, the day after this tweet was posted, it had 350 comments. 99% of them were negative. It might have actually been 100%. I didn't have time to check them all, but I actually could not find one positive reply, and it was very hard to find any polite ones. There were many references to the movie Dumb and Dumber, and lots of unkind comments about how both of these guys were on a train heading right off the political landscape. What polite enough ones to show you here there were had this sort of sentiment. Yeah, two blokes, 50 cents short of the dollar, says Country Healer. Yeah, everyone else who can't use it pays. That's great, writes Toby Campbell, someone who does apparently understand basic economics. Giles Baldwin also understands economics. He says, thanks to the taxpayer. Exactly. People really are waking up now. I still worry a little bit about the young, though. Even though we saw this happen in the news poll this week, the coalition, led by Peter Dutton, is now ahead in the first poll since the election on a two-party preferred basis, 51 to 49. What does that mean, two-party preferred? It means what the pollsters think is likely to happen after all the preferences are distributed in the election from the votes for all the minor parties. They usually use the data from the previous federal elections preference flows to kind of work that out as best they can, then they apply it to the survey. Those raw numbers across the top in this graphic, um, put together by the smart young people at Six News uh, and from the Australians News Poll originally, uh, those raw numbers across the top show that Labor is really lagging in support. That's the primary vote, okay? That's the, the people who would put number one beside that party on the ballot. Uh, fewer than one third of us Aussies uh, are backing the Labor Party now. Uh, even fewer than two in five Aussies could summon up support for the Liberal National Coalition. They sit at just 38%. One Nation is up a point at 7%, but most disturbing to me is that the Greens still sit at 12%. The Greens are not an environmental party, remember. They are a socialist party supporting radical left-wing ideas very publicly, pretending to be an environmental party. They support protesters calling for the elimination of Israel completely. They support shoplifting as a way to reduce poverty. They support squatting as a way to reduce homelessness. They have no respect for property rights. They think open borders and endless immigration is right for our country. They want free this and free that, but they never have a plan as to how to grow the economy to pay for any of that, except tax the rich and tax the corporations. Even though most corporations make single digit profits, many lose money 
and the number of rich people in the country is so small that if you tax them all at 90 percent you'd barely pay the interest bill on our government debt for one year the greens are a disgrace they're grifters playing on your kindness and your good nature to worm their way into power so how come they're at 12 percent well there's two types of green voters there's the young ones who you can kind of excuse for their ignorance of economics. They never get taught it properly at school and they think the government controls all the money and can just wave a magic wand and make stuff free or cheaper. And then there's the second type of green voter, the ones I really can't stand, the ones who have absolutely no excuse, the boomers and Gen Xers who should know better but haven't grown up yet. They vote with their feels and not their brains. And there's just too many of them in our country. And it is time they grew up. Like the rich people in big houses in my leafy neighborhood with greens signs out front. They've forgotten somehow how they made all their money. It was the free market liberal economic system, not socialism, kiddies. Or the ones who just want to seem cool and hip with the grandkids. Or the ones who are totally self-interested nimbies, not in my backyard people. And they just don't want any more development in their nice leafy suburb, you know, ruining the value of their beautiful multi-million dollar home. They are the most despicable mob of the despicable mob of all. The fact is that we are in pretty big trouble as a nation. We have federal government debt heading for a trillion dollars. And we have Victoria State at a quarter trillion and Queensland heading for 200 billion. This is unprecedented and totally, totally unsustainable. We're not the only country in this mess, but we are well up there. The US has a similar problem and a leading American economist, Dr. Joshua Rao, professor of finance at Stanford University, is so concerned that he put out a video this week on the PragerU Education Channel explaining why big government leads to big problems. By 1930, government spending at all levels, federal, state, and local, was just 12% of America's economic output. By 2020, it was 45%. And it's not just spending. The Federal Register, the list of all federal regulations, grew from 2,600 pages in 1936 to 90,000 in 2023. Administration after administration, decade after decade, the U.S. government just keeps getting bigger. And so does ours. According to data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics released at the end of last month, our total spending in Australia by all levels of government, federal, state and local, every year has topped $1 trillion at $1,066,000 million. $1,066,000,000. And the revenue all the governments bring in every year now stands at just a teeny bit more than that. So that means government is costing us $40,000 a year for every man, woman and child in Australia. Only about 12 million people pay income tax though, and they cop the brunt of this. But all of us pay tax through other means. We pay tax on the corporations through what we pay when we buy their stuff. We pay GST. We pay all sorts of taxes and charges and fines imposed by governments. Notice how they're getting crazily out of proportion to the offence. But it just keeps going up and up and up as government gets bigger and bigger and bigger. After all, why would any government want to reduce itself in size and power? What's the incentive for that? The only incentive would be to help them get elected if we voters actually valued less government and less government spending. But we don't. We keep rewarding the parties and the politicians that say they will spend more and give us more free stuff, which of course everyone with half a brain realizes isn't free. Back to the American example for a moment. Proponents of bigger government say that as America's challenges grow, the only entity that can meet these challenges is the government. Are they right? Let's consider three major areas of spending, education, healthcare, and social welfare. Education comprises about 14% of all government spending, from 1966 to 2016, adjusted for inflation, spending per student nearly tripled from $4,700 to almost $14,000. Has student performance nearly tripled? Nope. 
Another big area of government spending is Medicare. Its equivalent in America is Medicaid, and only the needy and the elderly get it over there. Now, Britain has a system of total public health care called the NHS, which is broke, and health services are in an absolutely terrible state. In America, is Medicaid achieving better outcomes? In a 2013 paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, researchers studied the expansion of Medicaid coverage for low-income adults in Oregon. They found that Medicaid coverage generated no significant improvements in physical health outcomes. The results are also disappointing for the federal welfare programs that comprise America's broad social safety net. These programs make up more than 20% of all government spending. In 2022, the federal government spent $9,000 per household on 80 different welfare programs. But these programs, in addition to mind-blowing costs, have all sorts of unintended consequences. For example, Americans have been famous for their mobility, their eagerness to follow opportunity wherever it takes them. But a 2018 Yale Law School study found that welfare programs often discourage low-income people from relocating to find better-paying jobs. Why? Because they don't want to lose the benefits they're getting in their state. It makes sense. In fact, lots of productive people have left the high-tax, high-debt states like California, while lots of people who want welfare have moved there. So Professor Rao says all this government spending isn't making Americans smarter, healthier, or wealthier. Maybe money isn't the problem. Maybe government isn't the answer. There is one more big factor to consider. All this non-productive government spending has landed us deeply in debt. Oh yeah, we know all about that in Australia. Add up the debt of our federal and state government and we are well over the $1.5 trillion mark. It's unprecedented. And let's not talk about the annual interest bill on that debt. Now the economists will say, oh, Australia's debt is a lower share of our GDP than other countries. And that's true, but we have one of the highest household mortgage debt levels in the world. So that private debt kind of cancels us out. What we need the kids to understand is that those 50 cent bus fares and all the government handouts are things that they will be paying off in the future. So they're paying for us. It's a disgraceful act of wealth transfer from the young to the old. That's not the way it's supposed to go in the natural order of things. It's supposed to be the other way around. But the young keep voting for the left. They keep voting for Labor and the Greens, buying the dumb lies that the Greens can pay for everything by taxing the rich and the evil corporations. It is a diabolically evil lie of deception from the left. And what makes it really immoral and sick is that the people at the top of these political parties, at least, maybe not all the members, but the people at the top making these strategies, they actually know it. The big government crowd that dug this hole has an answer for how to climb out. Tax the rich. Let's see what would happen if we did. A Cato Institute study considered what would happen if the government taxed 100% of all earnings above $500,000. Putting aside the absurdity of such an action, the study found that we would still be $200 billion short of covering the federal budget. And that assumes people wouldn't change their behavior in response to such confiscatory taxes. Why would anybody try to make a lot of money if they couldn't keep it? Yeah, good point. But isn't it funny that even if we did tax all the evil rich people 100% of their earnings, it would hardly scratch the surface of what the government spends, or should I say wastes. Professor Rao says we can get out of this mess by simply remembering the message of Ronald Reagan, that government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. For America's first 160 years, until President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, the government played a remarkably modest role in Americans' lives, and the nation prospered. The world had never seen anything like it. Even as the government has ballooned over the past nine decades, it has not been able to stamp out Americans' knack for ingenuity and innovation. But at some point, something will have to give. No great civilization has survived the enormous levels of debt that the U.S. government is now assuming. Why would we be different? That video is available in full on the PragerU website at PragerU.com. 
If we in Australia think we're any different, we're kidding ourselves. We're also hugely tied to the United States economically. We're also tied to Britain and China, but their economic stories and size of government are much, much worse. We need to decide. We've got an ACT election coming up this weekend. We've got the Queensland election coming up next weekend. Uh, Labor and the Greens are in power in the ACT, and they'll probably stay that way because that is Canberra is the city of bureaucrats, right? We can expect that. But we've got to ask ourselves, do we really want Greens, more Greens? As people move away from the major party, voting Green is really a very, very dangerous thing. Are we going to go down this socialist path? Are we going to buy into that simplistic Greens narrative? Are we that stupid of tax the rich, tax the evil corporations? That's how they're going to pay for everything, is it? Or are we going to make an effort to move back to small government and a culture of people who celebrate business success, celebrate individuals, celebrate our best and brightest and appreciate the hierarchies instead of tearing them down and seeking equality of everything. If we're going down the socialist path and making equality our goal, then we're in big trouble. You're watching The Other Side, your weekly analysis of the best news and commentary without the woke. And this is a very exciting and important week for us at The Other Side because we've just launched our new website and a new way for you to support the show and help us keep doing what we're doing and maybe even more of it in the future. Just go to othersidetv.com.au and sign up for free or sign up to the exclusive side and support us for as little as $4.50 a month. It's not even the price of a small coffee these days. We really do need your support to keep us going and growing because, as you know, we don't get $1.2 billion of money taken from taxpayers against their will to play with like our two cool for school friends over at their ABC. So that's othersidetv.com.au. Uh, and even if you can't afford to support us financially, please do sign up for free so that we can then still keep in touch if the misinformation and e-safety police ever do come after us, which is looking more and more likely every day, unfortunately. It's othersidetv.com.au, our new website. Check it out. Here at The Other Side, we do not get more than a billion dollars of taxpayer money like the ABC does to waste on fun stuff that we and our friends like while ignoring the public that we're supposed to serve. Uh, we have to rely on your support of this show. But I also hate asking for charity. So we've done a deal with what I think is the best VPN service in the world so that you can support this show and get excellent value for yourself in return. Private Internet Access VPN is a virtual private network. You download their app onto your phone, your TV, your computer, whatever you use, and it'll route all your data through a different server location so that you can't be tracked by the prying eyes of big government and big corporations. It keeps you and your family truly safe, and it will not massively slow down your internet speeds or make it harder to use your devices like some VPNs do. Private Internet Access, PIA VPN, is quick and easy to install, and once you've downloaded it, that's pretty much it. You can sign up using our special other side code for less than $3 a month. Unbelievable. That is a whopping 83% off the normal price. And you'll get the first four months free and you will be helping our show a lot. So get onto it. PIAVPN.com forward slash other side to get the special deal. And get this, if you've got a Netflix account, by signing on through a server in another country to Netflix, like the US, for example, you'll get access to that country's library of Netflix shows on your account as if you were in that country, which is also great if you want Netflix in a, in a different language or something. PIAVPN.com forward slash other side. The extremely patronising nature of left-wing politics and thinking was on full display in the US presidential campaign this week as former President Barack Obama decided he was going to scold black men for supporting Donald Trump. How dare you think for yourselves and not accept the pathetic endless victim narrative that we have designed for you, black men. Obama was caught on video speaking at a campaign rally. You're thinking about sitting out or even supporting somebody who has a history of denigrating you because you think that's a a sign of strength because that's what 
being a man is, putting women down, that's not acceptable. Wow, a whole lot of assumptions there. He wasn't speaking at a campaign rally, he was speaking to his campaign team, I should correct myself. Um, but it's the same old deplorative, deplorables narrative again, right? What he's saying there is that if you're an African-American man and you're not voting for Kamala Harris, then you're a sexist pig. It couldn't possibly be that you're actually smart, that the reason you're not voting for Kamala Harris is that she isn't able to articulate a clear policy position on things, doesn't seem to be able to speak off the cuff in an intelligent way, or is just not up to the job and has proven as much in the almost four years that she's already been in power. Oh no, it couldn't be any of those things. It must be that you're, you're just a sexist pig with a woman problem. Honestly, is anyone else getting tired of this lame gaslighting excuse that feminists and the left use to manipulate us? If anyone criticizes a woman that we're therefore automatically only criticizing her because she's a woman? Actually, yes, a lot of people are getting sick of it, as we've said in the show. Most black men in America are waking up to it, and Obama copped the roasting he so richly deserved for that pathetic, patronizing tantrum. But before we get to that, I want to show you more of what he said, because on this show we go deeper. He's looking angry. There's nothing worse than a lefty whose power is fading. The authoritarian really comes out in them, and so do the tantrums. How dare you not do what I say? How dare my old tricks not be working anymore? I'm going to go ahead and just say some, speak some truths, if you don't mind. Please. Yes. Because my understanding, based on reports I'm getting from campaigns and communities, is that um, we have not yet seen the same kinds of energy and turnout in all quarters of our neighborhoods and communities as we saw when I was running. Now, I also want to say that that seems to be more pronounced with the brothers. So if you don't mind, just for a second, I'm going to speak to y'all directly and say that when you have a choice that is this clean, when on the one hand you have somebody who grew up like you, knows you, went to college with you, understands the struggles and pain and joy that comes from those experiences, who's had to work harder and do more and overcome and achieves the second highest office in the land. And on the other side, you have someone who has consistently shown disregard, not just for the communities, but for you as a person. And you're thinking about sitting down? <laughs> but, you know, because Pookie might be. He might be. <laughs> and you're coming up with all kinds of reasons and excuses. I've got a problem with that. Because, because part of it makes me think, and I'm speaking to men directly, part of it makes me think that, well, you just aren't feeling the idea of having a woman as president. Mm -hmm. And you're coming up with other alternatives and other reasons for that. Oh my God, this is just so manipulative. You aren't feeling having a woman as president and you're coming up with other reasons to justify that. No, sorry, mate. You see this kind of argument all the time with the left in Australia too. And Obama really copped a backlash for this. Sorry guys, you aren't gaslighting us. We know why we are not voting for Kamala or supporting Kamala. And it has nothing to do with her gender or her race for that matter. So take your identity politics obsession, lefty, and shove it. 
At least that was the mood on the Cartier Family YouTube channel, one of the most popular African-American vlogs in the US. I also want to say that that seems to be more pronounced with the brothers. Why do with you the think brothers. that, brother? We don't with like the her. brothers. He kind of tugged his with own. With the brothers. Probably he ain't kinda, your brother, brother. He his own tuggy right there. I ain't your dumb. brother, brother. How about that, Obama? Kind of uh, Literally what he said, the left does to the right, though. That's Bro, what's Kamala crazy. That today. <laughs> That's what's insane. I don't understand why they keep using the Trumps. I have concepts of a plan and say she has actual plans. She has no actual plans. All her wow. plans are basically just diet MAGA. Like, oh, I want to be strong on the border. You not yet to be strong on the border. Oh, I want to have no tax on tips. Where'd you get that idea from? The identity politics BS isn't working anymore, lefties. Everyone with a brain seems to have woken up to you, as even the latest news poll from the American left-wing news network NBC shows. It all comes as our new NBC News poll shows Trump gaining momentum, erasing Harris's five-point lead from a month ago. The race now a dead heat within the margin of error. And asked about the Trump administration's policies, more Americans said those policies helped them while more Americans describe the policies of the Biden-Harris administration as hurting them. Ouch, that's trouble for Harris. Obama's tantrum won't have helped, so she's rolling out the policies now to try to win back black men. The Harris campaign is rolling out new proposals, including loans for black entrepreneurs and money for training programs. Another brilliant black man with a huge online video show and following in the U.S. is Devore Darkins. He was highly unimpressed with Obama's patronizing rant. Why is former President Obama making it about black men? What is it? Is it going to be black men's fault why she doesn't get elected? Why can't it just be, hey, if she doesn't get elected, it's because of a multitude of things. She's a part of an administration who's failed to do their job. She was the border czar. She failed on that. There's chaos in the Middle East. That's on their record as well. People can't barely get by because the cost of living has soared. Why, why can't it be about that? Why are you going out and making it about race? Because they're desperate. The Democrats always assume they have the black vote, but with 20% of black men now saying they'll vote for Trump and that number rising every day, they're panicking. This is only going to continue to backfire because the credibility when it comes to former President Obama has been burned when it comes to the black community. He sold us a lot of hope, but did not deliver. So for him to come out and tell black men, you need to vote for her because it's unacceptable if you're going to support Trump, that right there is going to sting, but it's not going to sting for black men, it's going to sting for her campaign. Yep. And even the radical far left wing Bernie Sanders supporter, Nina Turner, a Democrat state politician in Ohio, a media commentator and an academic, even she was slamming Obama's position. Why are black men being lectured to? Why are black men being belittled in ways that no other voting group? Now, a lot of love for former President uh, uh, Obama, but for him to single out black men is wrong. And some of the black men that I have talked to have their reasons why they want to vote a different way. And even if some of us may not like that, we have to respect it. So unless President Barack Obama is going to go out and lecture every other group of men from other identity groups, my message for Democrats is don't bring it here to black men who, by and large, don't vote much differently from black women. Interesting changes are happening in our political and cultural landscape in the West. And it wasn't just black men the patronizing leftists in the Democrats were insulting this week. As she said, they should insult all men. Well, she'll be pleased to know that they did. This ad was an insult to all men. And I'm man enough. I'm man enough to enjoy a barrel-proof bourbon. Neat. Man enough to cook my steak rare. Man enough to deadlift 500, then braid the out of my daughter's hair. You think I'm afraid to rebuild a carburetor? I eat carburetors for breakfast. I ain't afraid of bears. That's what bear hugs are for. And I'll tell you another thing I sure as shit am not afraid of. Women. Wow. Okay, so that's apparently what men are like, according to... I'd guess, having worked in New York periodically in my career in one of my many PR jobs, a, a bunch of under 40 year old marketing executives, mostly female and beta male who grew up in big cities and never leave them. The American equivalent of an Australian ABC producer. See, normal smart people actually know 
what they don't know. The problem with these kids is that they're ignorant and they think they're smart. And all they do is end up embarrassing themselves and their clients again and again by producing garbage like that. As one commentator put it, that was cosplay. Actors pretending to be what young urban women think men think and act like. You see, we're just all dumb, boofhead, deplorable yobbos, and if we were really sophisticated and well-educated like them, well, we'd understand that the only reason that we don't like Kamala Harris is because she's a woman and we're all big sexist pigs. Same old dumb lefty trick again. Same big fail. They want to be childless cat ladies? Have all the cats you want. Woman wants to be president? Well, I hope she has the guts to look me right in the eye and accept my full-throated endorsement. I'm man enough to be emotional in front of my wife. In front of my kids. In front of my horse. Oh my God, is it 1962? The old, men can't express their emotions and only if they express their emotions, the world would be such a better place, trope. Guys, really, you know, <laughs> men can express their emotions today. We're, we're absolutely fine, thank you very much. The problem these days isn't men not being able to express their emotions, it's men generally and masculinity generally, the non-emotional, rational side of humanity that's being disrespected and ignored and ridiculed and constantly men having their needs made secondary to women's needs so often, not all the time, but often in our modern culture. So an ad like this made by women patronizing men and mocking outdated silly stereotypes that only exist in the minds of dumb young feminists, yeah, it's not gonna work. And it got slammed as political news site The Hill reported. Reaction to that ad was extremely negative. The writer Lyman Stone said on X, is there anyone who watches this ad and doesn't feel like it was written by a lizard in a skin suit asking ChatGBT, list of manly things. Christopher Rufo wrote, this, mad, this ad is amazing because neither poll in the argument captures the spirit of being a real man. It's not about barrel-aged bourbon, deadlifting 500 pounds, nor is it about supporting IVF or voting for Kamala Harris. These are both caricatures. One is a left-wing mistranslation of manosphere masculinity. The other is an attempt to redefine masculinity. In left-wing ideological terms taken together, they represent a phony simulacrum of the male nature. Podcast host Tim Poole was a bit more succinct. He wrote simply, it's like Kamala has never met a man before. This Kamala ad is epic cringe. Epic cringe. Did you know that for every two to three teachers in Australia working hard in classrooms across the country, there is one taxpayer funded bureaucrat sitting behind a desk doing admin and making and enforcing rules and regulations that make those teachers jobs even harder. That's right, one bureaucrat for every two to three frontline teachers. That's how bloated our public service has become. But you'll never hear about it from the regular teachers unions because they also represent many of those public servants. So says the leading alternative teachers union in Australia, the TPAA. If you're a teacher, it's time to change to a union that will not only look after you without using your money to support the Labor Party, but which is taking on the government education system to sidestep those bureaucrats and use the savings to pay all teachers 25% more. The current waste must stop. All the red tape doesn't just suck up resources and time, it actually takes the teachers away from teaching our kids and it wastes their time filling in crazy paperwork for meddling bureaucrats. So join the union that will actually stand up against big bloated government. Join the TPAA, the Teachers Professional Association of Australia. To find out more, just Google TPAA. The TPAA's fees are half the price because none of your money goes to any political party. And as an Other Side viewer, if you use our special code, Other Side one when you sign up, you'll get a further $100 off your first year's fees as a rebate on your first payments. Go to tpaa.redunion.com.au, tpaa.redunion.com.au to sign up now for a better union and support the Other Side too by supporting our sponsors. Thank you, teachers, you legends. Now, speaking of patronising, left-wing, identity politics-obsessed people like Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, we have plenty of them right here in Australia. 
and they were on full display this week as the anniversary of the voice referendum passed. Once again, telling us that the reason we rejected the idea of putting a racist entire new chapter based on race in our constitution was because we're racist. To alter the constitution, to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? Yeah, nah, he lost me at to alter the constitution. <laughs> and adding a whole chop chapter to our constitution is hardly a, a tiny small change, Albo, or an alteration, as he tried to convince us in a campaign of massive disinformation and misinformation. But apparently it wasn't our ability to see through the lies and vote 60-40 against this horrible idea. It was that we had been the victims of disinformation and misinformation ourselves, which is why we're now being punished with proposed new laws to ensure that their lies can't be challenged by the light of truth. And they don't like that much. Just like Barack Obama, it's tantrum time when the left authoritarians don't get their own way. Voice co-architect Professor Tom Karma told ABC's 7.30 report program that the no vote has made everyone more racist. Now, what, what we've found, and, and we've reported on this, is that there's been a higher level of racism and racial slurs, uh, both on social media and, and um, you know, quite openly. And it, it, it's, it's like as if people think that they've now got a licence to have a go. And, um, and that's changed since yeah, the referendum. Yes, it has increased. And, um, you know, it's always been around, but it seems to be much more, um, you know, prevalent now, particularly on social media. Mm, better, better regulate social media. Better bring in some misinformation, disinformation laws so nobody can shine the light of truth on our lies anymore. It's funny, isn't it, when you, when you try to push race-based ideas onto a society of generally very nice, not at all racist people like Australians, the more extreme, nastier types will be emboldened to push back on you and maybe attack you not very politely. Maybe don't drive identity politics victimhood and race-based ideas in the first place. That might help, especially in a country where taxpayers already spend $40 billion a year more on our Indigenous community than other Australians. God forbid there should be any gratitude for the fact that we are clearly not a racist bunch. More worrying for me is, well, that's, I'm worried about that, but is, is the way the opposition um, is saying that they now have a mandate to, to review and, and, um, and play with Indigenous programs. They want an audit of all They uh, want an audit all of all the programs. Bodies. and Well, they, they're talking about all programs, actually, and um, all statutory organisations. And so that's a real concern. Oh, it's a real concern, all right, if people are ripping off taxpayers and the results don't match the levels of funding being taken. The opposition's Senator Jacinta Price wants that review so that she can get the money out of the hands of the grifters living large off the fat of a bloated bureaucracy and put it back where it is needed in feeding and educating and housing people in disadvantaged regional communities. God forbid you should have to undergo an audit like everybody else in the world has to. The Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians told Sky News that there were a number of reasons why Australia voted no to the voice to Parliament. So I think there was very little um, detail for people to understand exactly the consequences of what the voice might be. I think Australians didn't want to be divided along the lines of race within our constitution uh, and saw a whole lot of red flags that weren't, uh, you know, their, their concerns weren't quelled by um, the Yes campaign at all. She's a bloody smart and articulate woman, is Senator Price, and she's called out the left's patronising nonsense too. I think the fact that uh, Australians were told they'd be on the wrong side of history, that, um, you know, that they were racist, you know, calling people, people names isn't the way to go if you want their support. Mm. Uh, and I think there are a lot of concerned Indigenous Australians that we didn't necessarily see out in public, but thought that how is this bureaucracy going to be any different to any other bureaucracy? And, uh, you know, concerns that were raised with me were around, well, it's just going to create more division within our communities and families and who gets the powerful positions and that sort of things. Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians and future Prime Minister, I hope, Senator Jacinta Price speaking to Sky News. 
She says the idea of a legislated voice, as we've seen in some state parliaments, a voice imposed by law and legislation, is a step in the wrong direction and the focus now needs to turn to achieving tangible outcomes for marginalised Indigenous Australians. Despite the fact that Australians voted 60-40 against the voice and 70-30 in some states like Queensland, and the only place that voted for it was the ACT, the bureaucrat city of Canberra, at 60-40 in favour, showing how out of touch our federal bureaucrats in Canberra really are with the rest of the people of this nation, these state governments continue to persist with legislated voice style initiatives, again sending a message that our elected leaders do not care about responding to what we say and serving us, but they very wrongly think they're there to rule over us. You're watching The Other Side, your weekly analysis of the best news and commentary without the woke. And this is a very exciting and important week for us because we have just launched our new website and a new way for you to support the show and help us keep doing what we're doing and maybe even more of it in the future. Just go to othersidetv.com.au and sign up for free or better sign up to the exclusive side and support us for as little as $4.50 a month. That is not even the price of a small coffee these days. We really do need your support to keep us going and growing. Because as you know, we don't get that $1.2 billion of money taken from taxpayers against their will to play with like our two cool for school friends over at their ABC. That's othersidetv.com.au. And even if you can't afford to support us financially, please do sign up for free because then we can keep in touch. And if those misinformation and e-safety police come after us, othersidetv.com.au will still be available to you. Our new website. Check it out. And joining us as she does every week on the other side, the host of Spectator TV and editor of Spectator Flat White Online, Alexandra Marshall, the queen of Australian Twitter at Ali Melly. Uh, good to see you, Alexandra. How are you doing? I am in my native habitat today with my oh. coffee and my laptop, so all good. And it's Excellent. Friday. Excellent. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's in the magazine uh, and online uh, and on the show for Spectator uh, this week. I understand you'd be exploring uh, how things might look under the misinformation and disinformation regime if the e-safety queen and all of her friends get their way in Australia. Well, the great news is that we have this crystal ball known as California, where we can look into Australia's future under Albanese and the Safety Commissioner and see what really will happen. And what we've got over there is the Babylon Bee, that wonderful satire site we all love on Twitter, love it. is yep. currently suing California and Gavin Newsom, or I think they call them Gavin Nuisance, because yes. they, he's trying to, he's using the two brand new Californian misinformation and disinformation bills they put in to ban political satire around election periods. And as we all know, America spends most of its life in one election cycle or another. And so basically it's banning satire off the internet. And they're doing it under the idea of, oh, well, it's misinforming people and it could be dangerous. So that's one problem we've got. The other is in California, again, a committee has just stopped Elon Musk from expanding his marvellous space program because they don't really like him tweeting mean things online about transgenderism. So the entire future of the world's space race is hinging on some California people who don't like social media. Fantastic. There's our future right before our very eyes. Misinformation and disinformation laws used by a left-wing government to oppress and censor uh, freedom, essentially, which is what we're going to end up with here. California is kind of a, a crystal ball for us. Um, I understand that it was the uh, video, uh, the parody video, uh, the parody election ad about Kamala Harris uh, that first offended Newsom and led to these laws against satire coming in and against the Babylon Bee. Uh, but it seems that uh, that's backfired. There's been what they call online a, a Streisand effect in that uh, that video has now been seen by hundreds of millions of people, as Elon Musk uh, tweeted last week, I think. 
Well, it's exactly like the uh, cats and dogs effect that we saw with Donald Trump, where they said, oh, you can't you can't have this whole cats and dogs comment. And now there's an entire song and people are cheering and singing along to it at the beginning of Trump events. Same sort of thing with the Babylon Bee. But look, we've also got in the magazine our editor in chief, Rowan Dean, talking about cliff faces and cliffhanger, I think is the title of his article this week. But when I think of cliffhanger, Damien, I think of Sylvester Stallone hanging off the side of those mountains in that 90s era film you know that gore when he was really gorgeous but instead we've got albanese who appears to be i don't know redirecting funds off regional roads like my road and he's instead upgrading roads to his you know new beachfront cliffside match and that's the type of cliffs australia has right now yeah a little bit out of touch uh, a little bit tone deaf as they say and a little bit weird uh, we'll find out more about that one i don't think that story's uh, going to be going away anytime soon. And you've got uh, one more extremely interesting uh, little piece for us as well. Um, I'll let you explain this one. Yes, yeah, so our wonderful contributor, and who is also the editor of Quadrant, Rebecca Weiser, has a piece this week about the Grand Mufti. Now, this story, you see it come up uh, every now and then, but really it remains mostly unknown. But this is the Grand Muf Mufti who was whispering in the ear of Hitler during uh, the Nazi regime and is basically responsible for Hitler's extermination of the Jewish people. Now, what she wrote, and I've got one short paragraph here for your viewers because you'll find it very interesting, she wrote, it was the Grand Mufti who initiated the practice of calling Zionists Nazis, which takes the chutzpah because you can recall he was on the Nazi payroll. When Hamas fighters painted invert, inverted red triangles on places they planned to attack, they are copying the Nazis who forced all inmates of concentration camps to wear inverted triangles. Now, this is the uh, reminding people about where this history actually came from, because right now we've just seen another Hamas leader is gone. Thank yep. goodness there's one less one in the world. But there's an awful lot of people online, be they Christian or Islam, who are praising this dead Hamas leader as some kind of hero. And that's really disturbing. So pieces like this, which show the history, are very important. Yeah, I don't understand it. I don't get this reaction. I think it's uh, way over the top. Um, and we, we've got... You're a journalist, Damien. Journalists with half a million followers praising this dead Hamas leader as a hero of the people. From, from which organisations might these journalists come? Uh, I'd have to look him up. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, but there's no such... Thing. They are Western uh, journalists, Damien. Yes, yes Western... and no, no such thing as a neutral journalist would be my philosophy. But anyway, um, only those of us who try to sort of tell the truth and give the other side of the, uh, the, 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 the story, which is exactly what you do over at Spectator Alexander. So I hope everyone gets onto that, checks out Spectator TV. Friday nights at nine o'clock, you drop it. So uh, good to see you. We'll chat to you next week. Thank you very much, Damien. If you have a Netflix or other streaming media account from a global company and you're on holidays and log in from another country, you may have noticed that shows that are available in those other countries are different. That's because different media companies have different deals with different streaming services in different countries. Imagine being able to log into Netflix though, as if you were in America, or maybe a country that speaks a language other than English that you speak, to access more shows, but you can do it all without leaving your couch here in Australia. Well, there is a way, there is a way. Private Internet Access VPN is a virtual private network. You download their app onto your phone, your TV, your computer, whatever you use, and it'll route your data through a different server location. Not only can you access more content, but a VPN keeps you safe and secure and your family safe so that you can't be tracked by prying eyes of big government and big corporations. And it will not massively slow down your internet speeds or make it harder to, do, to uh, use your devices like some other VPNs do. Private Internet Access, PIA VPN. It's quick and easy to install and once you've downloaded it, that is pretty much it. And the great news is if you sign up for PIA VPN, you are also helping the other side heaps and getting great value for money as well. And you can sign up using our special other side code for less than $3 a month. That's a whopping 83% off the normal price and you'll get the first four months free. Just go to piavpn.com forward slash other side right now to get our special deal. That's piavpn.com forward slash other side.
politicians and senior bureaucrats who think they do not serve us but rule over us need to be taught a lesson and pull their heads in. We will punish you at the ballot box. And it's not only in relation to the voice referendum result that they seem to be completely ignoring and running roughshod over us because they think they know what's best for us dummies. This week we also discovered that most state leaders think that we had a referendum on the Republic again and that most Aussies voted not to be a constitutional monarchy anymore. I must have missed that one because, no, we didn't. But not one state or territory leader wants to attend the King's official reception event in Canberra. He's coming all this way and they can't even get to Canberra to say hi. Here's how the British media saw that news. The King and Queen are heading down under on a nine-day tour of Australia. It'll be the King's 17th official trip to the country and the first Commonwealth realm he's visited as monarch. But it's been reported that no state premier will be attending the planned reception to welcome the royals. This is a big moment for the King. It is his first major overseas tour since um, his cancer diagnosis. Australia will be the first realm he's visited. And for Australians, this is the first time they've ever had a reigning British King in their country. Now, the King has already, as we've been hearing, had to condense his tour due to his health. But I think a visit to the landlocked capital, Canberra, was never not going to happen. And it's here where he is head of state, of course, he's due to address a reception at Parliament House, the very political heart of the country. The Buckingham Palace said that that event would be attended by political and community leaders, but it's now being reported that not all will be there. So the eight state and territory premiers said they're not going, so they won't be there to hear the King's address. Now, the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper is describing this as a childish no-show. So the question is, what's going on here? That's Laura Bundock. She's Sky News UK's royal correspondent. What is going on here? I think it's tacky and cheap and pathetic, and the Sydney Morning Herald is spot on. Even if you're a Republican, the UK is a major ally and the mother country that gave us our systems of law and justice and parliament, and so much more that we continue to take for granted. Could we at least have a, and show a, a little bit of class? Or, or don't we do that anymore? We just behave like spoilt teenage know-it-all brats now, do we? Has that become our national cultural style? No, it hasn't. But it seems to have become the style of our political class who just will not listen and serve the people anymore. Remember, it's back in 1999 that Australia held a referendum on becoming a republic. Australians voted no back then. The debate went away. The polls show that support for becoming a republic has been dipping ever since. It was in 2016, you go back, all the premiers, the then premiers, signed uh, something, a, a document saying they want to become a republic. Nothing happened. There is a Republican Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, but even he has kicked into the long grass plans to hold another referendum on this. Well, Albo won't be having any more referendums after the voice debacle, that's for sure. I think Talk TV's UK, uh, UK's Mike Bell was, was right on the money with this comment. Most of these are state premiers, I mean, it's a bit like say, Sadiq Khan and Andy Burnham say we're not going to meet Donald Trump when he comes over. You know, who cares, frank, frankly? Um, most of them nobody's ever heard of. I read their names out to a couple of politicians yesterday, didn't know who they were. Um, you know, they're lefties, uh, they've got an agenda, and I suspect that King Charles is much more popular in Australia than any of them are. Spot on, Mike. Well said. A new poll shows only one third of us want Australia to become a republic. That's down from 45% at the time of the 1999 referendum. And most surprisingly, the poll from Pulse of Australia, reported in Sydney's Daily Telegraph newspaper, shows that one third support, that very low one third support, runs across all the main age groups from boomers right through to millennials. So there'll be no republic in our lifetimes. Charles and Camilla have always said that whether Australia becomes a republic is a matter for the Australian people to decide and that they've always had a deep affection for this country. Classy. Pity our state premiers can't show a micro dot of class and do their job of representing us for a change. <laughs> Thank you.
China has conducted a day of military drills around Taiwan this week in a worrying show of force in what it has called a stern warning to Taiwan's, quote, separatist forces. Hmm. China's claims that it has sovereignty over Taiwan are nothing new, of course, but this level of signalling of some kind of attack kind of is. This is the fourth round of war games around Taiwan in the past two years by China. But this time, the Taiwanese authorities said that they detected 125 Chinese aircraft, including jets and drones, a record number. China's irrational and provocative drills not only threaten stability in the Taiwan Strait, but damage the development of cross-strait relations and peace in the Indo-Pacific. China's Navy, Air Force, Army and Rocket Force were all involved, as German TV network Deutsche Welle reported. The drills serve as a stern warning to the separatist acts of Taiwan independence forces. It is a legitimate and necessary operation for safeguarding state sovereignty and national unity. The drills come just a few days after Taiwan celebrated its National Day, the first under Taiwan's new president, Lai Qingde. In his address, Lai said Beijing had no right to represent the people of Taiwan, infuriating Beijing. Analysts say the Chinese exercises were expected. I think it's very easy to look at these sort of high-scale military drills that the PLA puts on after any time uh, a Taiwanese leader makes this kind of speech now and just sort of have this guttural reaction of fear and panic that this could be a pretext to war, and that's absolutely not what this is. That said, in Taipei, residents can't completely ignore the threat. Over the past three or four years, we felt China's intimidation increase. We have to continue living normally. It does make us increase our vigilance. But for most people, it won't directly impact our daily life. That's part of a report on YouTube from Deutsche Welle TV. So how does all this impact Australia? Well, it could, quite a lot. Recently, the American Wall Street Journal newspaper has released an interesting video on the strategic importance of Australia to the United States military strategy for Asia. The biggest threat, of course, being the very assertive nature of China's President Xi Jinping's stance on Taiwan. As tensions between the U.S. and China continue to increase, America is sending thousands of troops to Australia and building infrastructure at key locations in the country. The U.S. and China have described Taiwan as the region's most volatile flashpoint. Taiwan is regarded by China as part of its territory, and Beijing has vowed to take control of the island by force if necessary. President Biden has said the U.S. would intervene militarily if that happened, potentially bringing America and China into direct conflict. And us as a result. The Wall Street Journal's Australia reporter, Mike Cherney, says that the U.S. is sending tens of billions of dollars to upgrade infrastructure as at several of these Australian sites. Tyndall is one of those sites, an airbase that will soon be able to host up to six B-52 bombers, long-range aircraft that can carry nuclear weapons. The runways and facilities here are being significantly expanded, making Tyndall one of the only bases in the region able to host B-52s. American Marines and fighter aircraft operate from bases in the north. U.S. military equipment is being stored over 2,000 miles away in the south. And American nuclear submarines will soon start rotating through a naval base on the west coast. Should war break out, the U.S. can send these forces to its network of bases spread throughout the region. There are 2,000 U.S. Marines in Australia commanded by Colonel Brian Mulverhill. Nobody wants a war with China, so how, how, does, how do these forces deter and bring stability to the region? It's really our main focus. We traveled with the Marines deep into the outback to see how they are fine-tuning a strategy seen as critical to fighting China in its neighborhood. Mike Cherney's full report can be found on the Wall Street Journal channel on YouTube. He goes into more detail about the US strategy and Australia's role in it should China ever decide to invade Taiwan. Any US military action in the region would involve America's large military bases in South Korea, Japan and Guam. But these bases and their fuel and logistics facilities would likely be targeted by China in the early stages of a conflict. Any reinforcements being sent from the U.S. West Coast to Asia could take days to arrive. Huge new tanks have been built in Australia's north to allow more American aircraft to refuel. The idea of creating infrastructure and to be able to forward posture capabilities is really important for us. U.S. Marines Australia Commander Colonel Brian Mulverhill speaking to The Wall Street Journal.
And that's all for this week on The Other Side, your weekly analysis of the best news and commentary without the woke. Please remember to tell your friends about the show. That's still the best way to help us. Do please follow us on X and YouTube. And we are now back on TikTok too. And watch out for our new shorts on YouTube also. They're very easy to share. Please do smash the like, subscribe, and every other button on all the platforms that you can. We need your help. We drop a new show every Friday night at 7 p.m. If you are watching on YouTube, to make sure you never miss any of our content, please hit the subscribe button below and hit the little bell because that'll notify you uh, when we post new content. And that's all free. And if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, do head over to our brand new website at www.othersidetv.com.au and sign up. Uh, become a member and join the exclusive side where for less than $5 a month, uh, you, can, you can help us keep on doing what we're doing and to help us grow into 2025 as well. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. I'm Damien Curry. Bye for now.